everyone. I'm David Wisner, and I'm very pleased to welcome you back to another episode of This Day and Age. Uh, we've been away for the last several days as uh, my Hellenic colleagues celebrate the Orthodox Easter. And uh, allow me to take this opportunity to wish everyone in Christos Anesti uh, Hronia Pola. Uh, my guest today is an old friend, Dimitris Boras, uh, a renowned uh, photojournalist who's been on the forefront of investigations of epidemics since 2013. He has a rather unique perspective to share with us today. So that's what we'll be discussing in this uh, series of uh, interviews with uh, Hellenic colleagues, Hellenes, who are uh, doing unique things and have a unique perspective on the current coronavirus crisis and uh, whose activities one would hope are a source of inspiration for colleagues in other parts of the world. So at this moment, I'm happy to welcome Demetrius Boris. Demetrius, welcome to the show. How are you faring? Welcome, and Christos Anesti. We're uh, very pleased to have you with us today. I understand that you've been uh, doing uh, some uh, work on the streets of Athens lately. Uh, I thought perhaps as a, a, by way of introduction, you could tell us a little bit about your background and the research and uh, work you've done in the field of epidemic studies. I'm pleased and honored being invited, first of all, and thank you for inviting me. And I hope that uh, we contribute to the discussion at least, and I will uh, offer, this is why my aim is to offer points, facts, and uh, uh, issues in sort to raise questions the question has to be examined in order to reach answer i don't want just to give uh, statements and uh, the absolute truth i'm the enemy of the absolute truth uh, and since you asked about the background i really do prefer this background to be revealed during the discussion which will be even more tempting for the audience i hope and uh, the key point here is uh, I'm observing, examining, and investigating the current situation as a whole using a word that is not even a key word. It's a single word that dominates and preoccupies everything. And this is the guidance of the situation in terms of examination and researching. Uh, the word is pandemic. And this word really includes and explains and describes everything. Epidemic diseases, David, are not random events that afflict societies without any warning, as we or many people thought. On the contrary, every society produces its own specific vulnerabilities. The st to study them is to understand the society, that society structure, its standard of living, and its political priorities. And uh, didn't came out of sudden. The first decade of the 21st century, the century we are living, have been marked by epidemics. Starts in 2002-2003, the swine flu in 2009, the Ebola in West Africa 2014-2015, the Zika 2015-2016, and now the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 disease. So epidemics are a category of disease that seems to hold up the mirror to human beings as to who we really are. Recently, David, recently I finished reading an excellent book by Dr. Frank Snowden, I'm sure you know, Professor Emeritus of History and History of Medicine in Yale University. The title of the, books, of the book, Epidemics and Society, From Black Death to the Present. The book offers a sweeping exploration of the impact of epidemic diseases, and it looks how mass infectious outbreaks have saved society, and this is what interests me. Professor uh, Student examines from the Black Death to today, and he argues that epidemics are a category of a disease that seems to hold up the mirror to human beings as we really are. Okay. That is to say, it obviously has everything to do with our relationship to our, what is the key issue for any human being, mortality, to death, and to our lives. They also reflect, and this is, I think, the most important issue of today's, he, how we create and the natural environment, how it responds. They show in this way epidemics, the moral relationships that we have toward each other as people, and this is what we are seeing today. 
and is well known, and if not, it's worth to mention here and worth to discuss about, have shaped history in part because they led human beings inevitably to be to think about really big questions. Okay. For example, the outbreak of plug raised the whole question of man relationship to God. You remember what, mm -hmm. what happened to the monarchy in France. People start questioning how could it be that an event of this kind could occur with a wise and all-knowing yeah. an omniscient divinity. Yeah. Bubonic plague, on the other hand, killed almost half of the full continent's population and therefore had a tremendous impact of Europe, right? coming on the coming of the Industrial Revolution and keep this as a point because now we have the, the fourth Industrial Revolution is coming. And also the bubonic plague had an impact on the slavery and the serfdom, the abolition of the serfdom. So epidemics, as we are seeing now, have tremendous effects on social and political stability, and more than that, to the international relations. If you see the big discussion, if just to say in a bit, <laughs> there is worse war, uh, the discussion between the United States, the Western, the so-called Western world, and the China in terms of the outbreak of this uh, pandemic. Right. So I think in this way we can say that there is not even there is not a major area of human life that epidemic diseases haven't touched profoundly. Okay. And the, recent cholera, the recent cholera and tuberculosis in today's world move along the fault lines created by the poverty and the inequality. And the way also, it's important to understand the way in which, as a people, we seem to be prepared to accept it as somehow right and proper, or at least inevitable. Inevitable. So yeah. these are the fundamental reasons leading me to decide to specialize in infectious disease epidemics from anthropological aspect. Yeah. It all started back in 2013 when I participated in a world conference organized by Tufts University in Boston, USA. The title and the topic of the conference was Global Health and Security. Right. During that course, I met with Dr. Christos Linteris from Cambridge University. At that time, Dr. Linteris was starting his research project upon the visual representation of the third plague pandemic, which broke in 1855 in Southwest China again, in Yunnan, and raised across the globe until 1959. We are, yeah. we are talking about a, a more than a century that causing the death of approximately 12 million people. Right. So my interest in infectious disease epidemics, and definitely pandemic, arises and is constantly renewed, not just, by the, not just by the recurring epidemics across the globe, but the way in which epidemics, both past and present, challenge and transform human societies. That is a very challenging uh, subject. And as you say, it's not something new that came out of the blue. The, there's plenty of uh, material to research and study from past generations. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the research you did in Ukraine in, uh, starting yeah. in 2013. Yeah, that's uh, really tempting. First of all, reaching this requires us to break down the barriers between the disciplines so we can grasp infectious diseases as biological, definitely, but as a social and historical forces. And in this way, we can really tear up what is covering the society and understand the social reasons that can bring or they can pave the way for an epidemic to appear. Okay. So the study of epidemics offers us a ground where social sciences and the humanities can move away from the role of data providers. This was my aim uh, in my research study in Ukraine. So we are not just data providers or mm -hmm. we the photographers or journalists or social anthropologists or social scientists and we detach ourselves from the role of deconstructors of science with the aim being meaningful in their disciplinary collaborations we do okay. not separate the practical from the meaningful or the applied ethical so by applying this we can begin to understand how epidemics and pandemics transform our society and in turn how we contribute to the emergence. Before entering into Ukraine case, uh, you know that I'm dealing a lot with uh, war uh, research uh, yes. in terms of photography and in terms of anthropology. And uh, since 2011, I had the unpleasant uh, 
let's call them pleasant privilege, to be present in various locations in alongside Middle East, Afghanistan, as well as in Ukraine, experiencing documenting from anthropological perspective this plight of humanity during unprecedented humanitarian disaster. And right. a part of the well-documented and well-known images of destruction, devastation, bomb selling, exodus, what really strikes me most of all was the status of health care. This is what we are facing today. The health system, the health care is our front line in, right. in a real world and facing untold challenges, recurring and resulting even to choices never dreamed, like those that they can find in war zone, considering uh, the decision that the uh, medical has to take, which is mathematical, but at the end is not mathematical at all. And I mean, how you solve the problem where the amount of the people in need for a respirator are greater, are bigger than the amount of yeah. resp available respirators. You, you have and to this choose is whom to prioritize. Now, and, and this is something that until now we could experience and face only in uh, war zones. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and if in the war zones this situation, this violently disrupted health and emergency assistance causes collateral damage. You know this famous uh, yes, buzzword. Yes, of course. Uh, yep. Using the collateral damage. And uh, healthcare and humanitarian workers nowadays in the current situation are increasingly in the crosshairs of hospital and aid centers have become part of the battlefields in today's war. Yep. So, during the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, there is a single image that, that occupies me. This of the loneliness of the dead body within pandemic. I put a title to signify its importance. And this is the working title of my current research study. Loneliness okay. of the coughing in the aftermath of the pandemic. Let me show you an image. Yes, if please I may. do. Please do. Loneliness of the coffin is right. the title. All right. Loneliness of the coffin in the aftermath of the pandemic. This image was taken during my filming, the filming of my documentary in Ukraine in 2018. My research study started in 2013, where I understood that there is a lot, there is like a whole population of undocumented minors living under the streets of Odessa and other cities in Ukraine in relationship with the health and the social system of Ukraine. So, as a result of my research study upon tuberculosis epidemic and MDR, multidrug resistant tuberculosis epidemic in Ukraine, in relation with augmented minors living homeless in the streets, but mainly under in catacombs. Yes, we un under the streets. Yeah. We came under the streets, right, in catacombs and in boxes. The earth where the heating system of the city connects and they have valves. So there is total darkness and humane conditions and people they form communities there in the process of the documentary and the research i broke in into several sanatoriums the, one day just opening the gate the entrance door of the sanatorium i saw this loneliness of the coffin loneliness of the dead body the dead body laid down on the street on the pavement some workers wearing protective equipment they have to carry this alone isolated and let me show you another image so this image shows the removal of corpses during the plague epidemic in manchuria 1910 1911 and both of the images they share the same they have the difference the only difference is one is color so that in 2018 the second so that in 1910 is a black and white but both presents the same the loneliness of the coffin in the aftermath of the pandemic. Since the beginning of the recorded history, humans have lived in the threat of the epidemic disease. Right. I realize that in spite of vastly different diseases, that they have afflicted very different societies, all epidemics in human history have one thing in common. They have raised the question of the way we deal with the death. Death as a reality, death as a procedure, but more than that, what appears as fundamental issue to me is the dead body, the body of the dead, the trauma and the memory. This body carries something that is extremely significant for the society at large. 
I mean, surely there is the logistic part that is tricky and really vivid and graphic. Something that we have seen recently in Italy with the, arm, uh, the trucks of the army carrying dead bodies yeah. in Bergamo, yeah, or yeah. the Milan the morgue that has seized its operation due to heavy load of dead bodies that created an overcapacity. Uh, the very of dead bodies in New York State. New York Island. City, the refrigerator York truck City. parked outside the hospital. It's horrific. Uh, exactly. More than that, though, is how we deal with the dead body at first. The right. process of death in an ICU unit, isolation. Not even the face of your therapist is visible. And if lucky, there might be a possibility to be to have a teleconference, a video call with the family. Yeah. And furthermore, dead body is now treated by an epidemiological protocol, not applying any religious or spiritual liturgy. In short, everything happens in RAS due to the fear of the contamination, something that is again common practice only in war zones. Yeah. Yeah, when you have to dispense of large numbers of dead bodies very quickly, there isn't time for an individual burial ceremony. You might be able to think about it after the fact, but certainly not when it happens. And when you think that there's the risk of contagion with an epidemic or the, the pandemic, as you call it, then it becomes that much more urgent to dispose of the, the corpse as quickly as safely as possible. Yes, but uh, this is a, 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 key, a key point, how the society transformed, not just because of the practical issues, but due to the fear mm -hmm. and how citizens are giving also civil rights about, upon, upon privacy and civil liberties. Right. And really, this is why I think it's really a, a striking point because the dead is really something uh, sacred, even by enemies in the war. Mm -hmm. You know, you remember even the first war, the second war, there was truce, the yeah. armies, they exchange the bodies or they collect the dead bodies of their comrades. Uh, and they, you know what, Dimitri, it goes back to the Trojan War. There, you know, you have a, a white flag and the, the soldiers go out and they collect the dead bodies. It's, uh, it's part of, human history and now it seems as if this practice of honoring the fallen dead has been transformed hasn't it you're saying that it's a question of medical protocol before anything else uh, how, yeah and yep now i want to ask you how is it then that you're able to conduct your work today in such really altered circumstances it's like being in a war zone you used the word war a little while ago when we were discussing the the you know the kinds of material and the topics you wanted to discuss H how is it that you're able to do your work as a photojournalist as an anthropologist as a social scientist in the current conditions um the role of the photography is important it's crucial, as I mentioned, because it connects, it breaks down, it deconstructs and constructs at the same time. And central to the general public experience of the current condition we are experiencing has been the use of photography. As I said, in recent weeks, we have seen this medium capture the impact of the new coronavirus across the globe from the ways in which different countries are trying to contain it to the impact both of such measures and of the disease itself upon individual and communities. Image of hospitals, animals suspected as the potential origin of the pandemic, empty cities under lockdown, people swarming supermarkets for toilet paper and rice and pasta, or people expressing solidarity from their balconies have become now visual staples of our increasing, increasingly online lives right. over and the past couple of months. So that's, that's how we're communicating right here. now. Yes. Uh, Definitely, that's a better example. <laughs> Correct, you said all. What? But before entering into today, I would like to stress out that what is rarely considered is that the ways in which we visualize epidemics and as a consequence the way we experience them were established not nowadays, not recently, 
but in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, in the course of an event that is all but forgotten in most parts of the world, is that is third pandemic. So the turn of the 19th century was the first time that photography was used to depict an infectious disease outbreak. But it was also the first time that such an outbreak was understood. And this is the key word. Photography contributed to the understanding that both by scientists and by the general public, that this case constitute a pandemic. And this is really crucial because local outbreaks, no matter how small, captured by the photographic lens, were no longer simply outbreak in Porto, Los Angeles, Buenos Aires, Cape Town, Mumbai, Bologna, or Thessaloniki. Right. They were part of an event that was seen to threaten, to threaten the fabric of the modern world. In fact, in fact, it can be argued that the, this wide coverage of this global outbreak and that worldwide distribution of photographic images by the press, to the press, even from the tiniest, the smallest outbreak, played a major part in transforming the idea of pandemic from an arcane word can be found in a medical dictionary to a word, to a reality, to a condition that is experienced in everyday life. And this field of vision and experience of the world is played out today before our eyes once again. Mm -hmm.